Good morning, my church family. I hope you're doing wonderful this morning. If you would stand. As someone who is an extrovert who loves being around the people after being cooped up this week, guys, I was so excited to be here this morning. I'm so excited to see all of your lovely faces, and I am so excited to worship our Lord and Savior this morning. So if you would, let's lift our hands and surrender to Him um, as we lift up His great and His holy name. God, we just worship You. We praise You, and we thank You so, so much for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the life uh, that he has so graciously given to us. And with that breath that we have, God, we give it back to you in the form of praise and worship and song this morning. Jesus, may you receive the praise that you and only you deserve. We ask all these things. We rejoice in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Let's worship this morning. I was buried beneath my shame And you can carry that giant of weight It was my tool Till I met
Church, if you would, I want you to turn around and I want you to wave to at least five specific people. Okay? <laughs> All right. Guys, we are so incredibly excited that you are here with us this morning. If you would, you may have a seat and we will watch some video announcements. Good morning and welcome to First Assembly of God. My name is Pastor Crystal. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are excited to worship with you and to look at the word together. But before we begin, let's take a moment and look at some upcoming announcements. We are so excited for our first time guest. When you came this morning, you should have received a welcome packet. We'd also love to invite you to our connection room so that we are able to visit with you after service. We hope that you feel right at home this morning. There are multiple ways that you can give this morning. You can give online at brokenbowfirst.org. Our baskets in the front, our boxes are in the back. Thank you again for giving. Our Easter Outreach You've Been Egged is coming soon. Although this egg hunt looks different this year, we still need your help to make this happen. We need donations of eggs, prizes, candy to be delivered to our front lobby, as well as signing up to volunteer to help deliver these egg hunts. Thank you for helping us bless our community. Our Connect Group season kicks off at 6 p.m. We are excited to break off into smaller groups, fellowship with each other, study the word, and most importantly, connect. Each group will meet here at the church. Sign-up sheets are available in the foyer. If you have any questions, please see Denise Webb. Sunday, February 28th is Juan Carlos Day. Juan is a vital part of our Hispanic ministry and our church family. On that day, we will take a special love offering for Juan to help his fight against cancer. Please prepare your hearts now to give for this very special man and his family. For more information on these announcements, you can check our website at brokenbowfirst.org, our Facebook pages, or you can follow us on YouTube. God bless you and have a wonderful service. All right, church family, if you would, stand again with us. Really excited this morning to learn a new song with you. Um, the theme of the song basically is looking forward to getting to worship King Jesus in his throne room. And you know that what we read in the Bible, it's not it's not something that just happened in the past. It's not just something that's happening in the future. We read about it in Daniel. We read about it in Revelation. And we know that right now at this very moment in the throne room of God, this is what is happening. And even though we can't be there today, I really hope that the desire of the hearts of this congregation is to bring glory to the Lord for our worship to be pleasing to Him and for us to never lose the fact that our God is so incredibly holy. So I'm going to be reading to you guys out of Revelation 4 this morning. Um, obviously, this is John speaking. Immediately, I was in the Spirit, and there was a throne in heaven, and someone was seated on it. The one seated there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian stone. A rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal, was also before the throne. Four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back were around the throne on each side. The first living creature like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. 
Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside day and night. They never stopped saying, and this is what I want our church's cry to be this morning. Holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And in verse 11, they say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Church, can we praise the Lord for his holiness this morning? Lord Jesus, there is no one like you. You are so great and worthy to be praised.
We are, are talking about love this month. It's the, uh, the month that we specifically talk about love. Uh, we sort of isolate, focus in on this one month as, as a month of love. Well, what's love, really? What is love? Uh, the title of this series has been simply called Real Love. Real Love. You know, love is one of the most important themes throughout all the scripture, and it's repeated time after time again. And it's, the truth is, if you boil down the, the, the gospel, the entire word, really, if you, if you boil it down to one word, you find that word to be love. Love. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's, it's about love. In fact, the word love is used over 500 times in the scripture. So what does love mean? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, you'll find a lot of different meanings, perhaps. Uh, an intense feeling of deep affection. Maybe a deep romantic or sexual attachment to someone. Uh, something else might be caring deeply for someone. Or to find pleasure in something or someone. When I ask about love, I love how children describe love. You've read these and heard them many times, perhaps, different ones. I just love to see how kids react about this word called love. Noel, age seven, said, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt, then he wears it every day. Rebecca, who's eight years old, said, since my grandmother got arthritis, she can't bend over and polish her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time even after his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Kimberly, age seven, says, when you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out at you. Yeah. Jessica, eight years old, concluded, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you say it, you should say it a lot because people forget people forget. Well, I think that's where we are. Sometimes we need reminding of God's love. We, need, we sometimes forget. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, about what's love. If you'll Google that word, and we Google everything today, right? I mean, we Google everything today. If you'll Google that word love, you'll find that it's a most, one of the most written about subjects in all of our history of civilization. It's baffled one, the, the mind of poets and authors for years and years. Those, that's because there's two things about this word called love. One, it's a mystery. Amen, it's a mystery. Have you got it figured out yet? I, I don't have it figured out yet, this thing called love. You can't pin it down to one thing. Uh, the writers can't pin it down to one thing. The authors, the poets, they can't pin it down to one thing. It's a mystery about it. And number two, it's abstract. It's abstract, meaning simply there's various expressions of love. We all express love in different ways, don't we? We all express love in different ways. Perhaps holding a hand, arm around somebody. Perhaps uh, Kim took a picture of me last night. My dog was sitting in my lap, looking at me square in the eyes, just like it. I could almost feel him saying, I love you. Uh, that's, that's love, you know, we just see it in different ways. It's expressed in different ways. Well, John, the writer of, of uh, not only the Gospel of John, but the letters of John, he wrote in the fourth chapter of John's letter, 1 John chapter 4, could well be called uh, the other love chapter, referring to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. John's letter uh, in 1 John could very well be called the other love letter. In our text today, John talks to us about love. Now, I know some of you guys don't want to hear about this, right? You don't want to hear about this love. You, you know, you'd rather be deer hunting or something like that, you know, working out in the field or plowing the garden or something like that. You need to hear about love this morning. And John talks to us about love. And, and he didn't say, I like the way he referred to it in the scriptures there. He didn't say love is God. Love is, love is God. In fact, without hedging, without blinking, without hesitating, 
He simply said, God is love. God is love. Let's make sure we know exactly what John's talking about here. He uses four, in, in, the, in the New Testament, John had a, chan, a choice of four Greek words. You've heard them before. Let me just say them to you again. The first, the first Greek word that is often used in the, in the New Testament is the word eros. Eros. Usually it's sex, uh, associated with a sexual type of love or a passionate type of love. Uh, usually between a husband and a wife, that kind of thing. This love seeks to get something, get love, uh, get something from someone. Uh, you can see where that might go. The second word that John had the choice of using was storge. Storge is a natural type of love. It's the love between people, the normal love that one expresses between one another. Maybe the type of love of parents and the children or parents and family members, that kind of thing. You express it with this kind of love. This is a love which recognizes we are dependent upon one another. We need each other. And this is more of a caring type of love. The first one was a getting type of love. This one is a caring type of love. The third word that is used in the Greek is philos or phileo. And this is a love among friends. Uh, if I would say I love you this morning, it would be a phileo type of love. We're, we're friends and I love you as a friend. This is love which takes pleasure in someone's friendship or someone's company. So it's a sharing type of love. So there's a getting type of love, there's a caring type of love, and there's a sharing type of love. And then God, uh, or John could have used this last Greek word, agape. And that's the one we hear a, a lot about mostly, it seems like. But uh, this is love which compels one to sacrifice for the good of another person. So you're sacrificing for someone else. This is love that is shown without seeking anything in return. So I love you, and you don't have to say I love me back or anything else. I just love you, and I'm not asking for something in return. This love seeks to give rather than to get. It seeks to, it's a giving type of love. So we have a getting type of love. That's an erotic type of love. It's when you're going to do something and get something in return. It's a getting type. I want to get something from you. There's a caring type of love. There's a sharing type of love, and then there is this, this love that is giving, this giving type of love. This is the word that John uses in our text this morning. And I love how John, the apostle who wrote more about love than anyone else, speaks about love. I love the way he speaks about love. He says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, 1 John 4, verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that, that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. There you have it. There you have this great description of love. This is love. In this is love, he says. God is love. And only God is love, but God shows love. God is love and God shows love. I'm going to break down that, that chapter or that verse this morning if I can. It says, in this is love. In other words, love consists of this. If you're going to list the the ingredients of love, the ingredients of a cake mix. This is what love consists of. Literally, it means in this is love. In this is the love. That's it. That's it. This is the answer that we've been looking for. John is telling us, in this is love. That's what you and I have been searching for all of our life. Remember the old song 30 years ago, probably, looking for love in all the wrong places. Some of you never heard that song before. Some of you lived that song and didn't know it was written. I remember that song. Uh, Irving Cowboy, I believe it was. Looking for love in all the wrong places. We seem to be looking for love in all the wrong places. We look for it, and we we can't ever find the love that, that John is describing here, the love that really satisfies us. This is that love. It's the answer that we've been looking for, the, the answer that people for centuries have tried to understand, this kind of love. And John is giving us the answer. We're, what is love? I don't know what love is. All the little children didn't have an answer to love. They just had all kinds of variations of it. You and I have our own definition, our own variation of love, what love might be. And and John nails it. He nails it right here. This is love, he says. But then John says something else. He says, what love is not. In this is love. But I want to tell you something else. Love is not this right here. Love is not this right here. Love is not defined 
or seen by looking at ourselves as the starting point. You and I didn't instigate love. We didn't initiate love. <clears throat> looking back on Kim and I's relationship, I know you probably don't want to hear about our relationship, right? Looking back on Kim and I's relationship, it was pretty fast moving. Uh, <clears throat> once I saw her, I knew that she was the, the, the woman of my dreams. She was the one and only. I saw her walk. She applied for a job where I was working at, and, and I told my boss, I said, you got to hire her, regardless of the qualifications. <laughs> it didn't matter. We, we, we we're just working at a grocery store. I was a stalker in a grocery store, and she was applying to be a checker or something, I guess. I don't know what she's applying for. I think she's applying to date me, but I'm not real sure. But nevertheless, I don't want to get off the track on that too much, but I, I remember when I saw her, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to date that girl. I'm going to date that girl. Right off the bat, I said, I'm going to date her. I'm going to ask her out. I said, you got to hire her. And my boss's name was Rick, and I said, Rick, you got to hire her. I'm going to date her. I'm not sure what that had to do with anything, but I could at least got her phone number off the application, right? <laughs> so, I, so I started dating Kim. My, our first date... I remember seeing something on Facebook a week or so ago. I I tried to get on there and do it, but I'm not smart enough to get on there and figure it out, so I didn't do it. But it was some some things about about your relationship, that kind of thing. And uh, who said love first? You or her? You or her? I loved reading reading some of you. Some of you got on there, uh, and I love having some inside information on you now. But. uh, who said love first and, and those kind of things? Are, who gave the first kiss? Who initiated the first kiss? I, uh, I think I did and I did on both of those things. I know she wanted to. Now, why does that surprise you? Why does that shock you? I know she wanted to say I love you first, and I know that she, we were in the parking lot. We'd, I, we'd gone on, I, I, I love some of your first dates. My first date with Kim was at McDonald's, last of the big spenders, right? It was after work one night. She got off. I'd already gotten off, and, and I said, let's, let's go grab a hamburger at McDonald's, you know. So we went to McDonald's and came back to the parking lot there, and I gave her a goodbye kiss, first kiss, first kiss. About a week or so later, I mean, I'm a big spender. I mean, I was a stock boy making probably three bucks an hour at maybe three bucks an hour back then, and uh, so I didn't have a lot of pocket change, you know. And my second date with Kim was to Sonic. Stepped up. Before, you know, you get those already made patties. These are Sonic burgers. I mean, they're freshly cooked, right? So I was stepping up and, and I remember looking across the, the car at Kim. Again, she dated me because I had a 71 Mustang Mach 1. Didn't care about me a whole lot at all, but she loved my car. That's the truth of the matter. She didn't say she'd love me first. She said, I love your car first. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, she may have kissed the hood of the car. I'm not real sure, but she may have kissed the hood of the car before she kissed me. But I remember looking across the part, the, the seat at her there, and had bucket seats, you know, and I remember looking across the car. I said, I made a stupid statement. I probably looked back on it and said, it was crazy. I don't know what I was even thinking, but I said, I'm going to marry you. We hadn't even been dating a week, not even a week, but I was a prophet. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to marry you. And she said, yeah, I know. <laughs> no, she didn't. It took a while to coax her, and this is in August. And I finally coaxed her into marrying me in, in November. I proposed to her in November. I actually proposed to her in August. She just didn't know it. I proposed to her in November, and we, we set the date then for the next July and stuff like that. So it was a fast thing, moving the relationship. And the thing about it is, in this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us. That God loved us. We think we're the starting point of that relationship. We think that we are the one who initi- initiates this relationship with God. We think God... You're so awesome and so great. We're, we love you. 
But he, he, he didn't, it didn't, it didn't come across that way. Our natural, see, our natural response is not to God. Our natural response is not toward God. John uses the negative signifying before we were born again, before we were born again. See, we absolutely, before you know Christ, before Christ comes into your heart, this is the truth of the matter. You like it or not, this is the truth of the matter. We are, we are not in love with God. We don't love God. The natural man does not love God. The natural man likes to have fun. The natural man has to pull away from God. The natural man, in fact, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5 verse 10 that we are enemies with God. Not only do we not love him, but we are in direct contrast to his ways. We don't love God. We are enemies to God. Natural man cannot express the quality of love that John is talking about here. In this is love. We don't understand that. It's not in us to express that kind of love. Our natural response to God and to this kind of love is a selfish kind of love. If we say we love God, it's because we want something in return. We are self-centered, self-absorbed type of love. And that's what we are saying when we say we love God. But don't forget, don't forget this kind of love that we're talking about this morning. It's not a getting love. It's not a caring love. It's not a sharing love. It's a giving love. That's the kind of love I'm talking about. Our love is a getting love, a caring love, a sharing love. But God's love is a giving love. Not that we love God, he says. John's saying, not that we love God, but that God loved us. That God loved us. That word but should always prompt us to ask, because it's a, it's a conjunction, I believe. And it should always prompt us to ask, what is the contrast being compared to here? He says, not that we love God, but that God loved us. So he's asking us to look at this sentence and break it down a little bit. And he's saying, what is the writer trying to contrast? See, first John gives a negative statement followed by a positive statement. Not that we love God, a negative statement, but that God loved us, positive statement. But that God loved us. Now that's something. I know it is about me. That's something. That God would love me. I don't know about you. You may have been brought up in church all your life. You cut your teeth in church and all those kind of things. And you just, you just out, of, out of the womb, you love God. I don't know. Well, I wasn't that kind of guy. I wasn't that kind of guy. I didn't know God, didn't love God all those years of my early life. And to think that God would love me is more than I can almost comprehend. To, to know that he would love me when I was still in my sin. Now, I wasn't a hardcore sinner. Anybody in here a hardcore sinner? You wouldn't admit you were if you were. We, we're all hardcore sinners. Come on. Because we, we, we try to justify our sin. I'm not that bad. I just did this. Or I'm not that bad, I just did this. Or I didn't do any of those things, I'm not bad at all. But the Bible tells us that we were born in sin. We, our, our first fathers and mothers were sinners. And we have that gene in us. It's part of our lives. We are sinners. And just to think that, that God loves us while we were in our sin. When the truth is, he had every reason not to love us. He had every reason not to love us. I can think of 10 million reasons why I love Kim, but I can, she can also think of 10 million reasons why not to love me. <laughs> why, we've got every reason not to love me. God's got every reason not to be in love with me. We don't initiate the love for God. God initiated the love for us. God loves us first. God, in fact, I can say it this way, getting back to my relationship. God loves us first. He was the, for, he was the one who, who asked us out on the first date. God asked us to come and walk with him. God asked us to, he initiated the, the first day. He, in fact, initiated the first kiss when he kissed us with heaven. God always loved us first. He loved me first. Love that initiates is stronger than love that responds. Love that initiates is stronger than love that responds. His love for us 
initiated the relationship of love between us and him. Our love only responds to his love. Our love is a reciprocal love. He loves us, and because he loves us, we love him back. You understand that? Are you with me? Because he loves us, we're not drawn to him naturally. The natural man is sinners, and we like sin, and we like to pull away from the holiness of of God. But because he initiated that first love for us, we only respond to that love. He loved me, so I come running to him. This is love. This is love. That God loved us. That God loved us. And not only that, but he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He loved us and he sent. He sent. He loved us and he sent. And that word and links the fact of God's love with the act of God's love. The fact of God's love is God loves us. God loves us. Now, he can love us without ever doing anything for us. But the Bible says he loves us and linking the fact of, the, of, our, of his relationship with us with the act of our relationship with him. He loves us and he gave his son for us. Gave his son for us. He sent. Three times in this section, John writes that the father sent. The Father sent, that we might live through him, 1 John 4, 9, verse 10, that he would be the propitiation for our sin, and, and verse 14, and that he, would be the, he sent him to be the Savior of the world. The Son of God was sent to be the Son of Man that, we might die, that he might die for mankind. His death was not an accident. I've been reading about it a little bit as we near toward Easter time. His death was not an accident. It was an arrangement. It was an appointment made from heaven. God made the appointment with his son that he would come and be man, that he could die for man, that we could live in Christ. He sent his son to be the propitiation, that word propitiation. You use that word every day, I'm sure, don't you? Yeah, propitiation. I use it all the time. Propitiation, it means to appease or to render favorable, to make a covering. It's a word that means to act with, at, at, at one with. It's also a word that's translated reconciliation. So he sent his son to be the reconciler between God and man. It means an intense change. It means the removal of hostility. In fact, I believe it's Paul that wrote that there was a, there's a barrier between us and God. There was a barrier that separated us from having a relationship with God. But Christ on Calvary tore down that barrier. He broke down that wall of petition. He tore that barrier down that we could come into his presence and have a relationship with him this morning. In sending his son to be the propitiation for our sins, The Bible says that Jesus, as a sacrifice, was made a covering. Hebrews talks about it. The Old Testament refers to it oftentimes, that he could be a covering for our sin. He covered our sins. His blood, the Old Testament, the Bible says that they placed the blood over the doorpost to be a covering, that the death angel would pass by them. That Well, in the New Testament, he became that blood covering for us. Hallelujah. For our sins, for my sins, and for your sin, he became that, that covering for us, that propitiation for our sins. You know, God's love is so great that he provides the means of salvation for us. He didn't just say there were, that, we needed a, that we needed a means of salvation, that we needed a sacrifice, but he provided that atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Take careful note of this, of what comes first. What comes first here? It is because of God's love for us that he gave his one and only begotten son. Because he loved us, he gave his son for our sins. It's not not the case that God loves us after the sacrifice had been offered. After the sacrifice had been offered, it made the way for us to have No, God loves us before the sacrifice. In fact, he loves us or there wouldn't be a sacrifice. He loves us before the sacrifice.
before the sacrifice. When the Bible talks about God's love, the cross is on his mind. He's always thinking about the cross. When the Bible talks about God's love, blood, the blood of Christ is on his mind. When he talks about God's love, the, the crucifixion is on his mind. You see, all those things, the cross, the blood, the crucifixion, it all ties in to God's atoning sacrifice for our sins. You and I are sinners. Sinners. We don't have, we're not worthy to come before his presence. We're not, we're, not, we're not able, in fact, we're not only worthy, we're not able to come into his presence without the blood sacrifice. Until the atoning blood of Jesus Christ was poured out on Calvary's cross, you and I had no access to him. Remember the story, I'm getting into in, in Easter time, I guess. Getting into the story, remember when, when Christ was crucified, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, not from bottom to top. Not from bottom to top. If it was torn from bottom to top, it would mean that you and I were able to rent that veil, would tear that veil. You and I could grab hold of it, and we could split it because it was down on earth. But it was torn from top to bottom. And when it was torn, my friend, let me remind you, before, before the veil was torn, only the high priest could go into the, the very presence of God. But once the veil was torn, it made access for a commoner like me and you to come into God's presence and to walk into his grace and find him as a loving God. Hallelujah. God took the initiative. God took the initiative. God was the one who initiated this Operation Rescue. When you and I were apart from God and we were lost and undone and didn't have any hope of tomorrow, didn't have any hope of a relationship with him, it's God who initiated this Operation Rescue to rescue mankind from their sin. He loved us. I don't know why. I don't know how. But he loved us. And he loved us so much, the Bible says that he sent his son for our sins. He sent his son to die for our sins. The Bible talks about how for a righteous man we would willingly die. But for somebody who is sinful, no good, unworthy, the Bible says that he died for you and I. I don't know about you, but I think that's real love. That's real love. That's more than me rubbing Sister Kim's feet. It's more than her fixing my favorite meal. He loves us. And he gave himself for us. Hallelujah. The songwriter had it right when he, had, when he asked, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Oh, amazing love. What amazing, amazing grace, amazing love that he would die for you and I. 1 John 4, 10. In this is love. In this. In what? In his covering for our sin. The expression that God sent his son for us. In this is love. Not that we love God first, but that God loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation or the covering for our sins. You know, the Bible is a collection of records from beginning to end, that tells us how people like you and I, you and I, and about the God who sought us out, just like he sought Adam and Eve out, and just like he sought Noah out from among the people, and Abraham to be his chosen vessel, and Moses, Moses, the murderer, and Peter, and the rest of the disciples, Paul, persecutor of believers he sought God sought them out I remember 1974 I was dating sister Kim and her mom had a had a, a rule a stipulation that I could only date her if I went to church I thought, well, I can hang out in church for an hour to get to be with Kim forever. So I went to church with her. 
Henderson Hills Baptist Church, Edmond, Oklahoma. Kenneth Lay, the preacher, he had preached, and they didn't say very many amens in that church, but there was one guy that sat about four rows in front of us, and he, had, he, had, he couldn't contain himself. He was Baptocostal, I guess, but he would raise his hands up, and he'd shout a hallelujah every now and then, you know, or amen, or whatever the case might be. But I remember in November of that year, a Sunday that Brother Lay gave the message, and at the end of the message, he gave the invitation. And I remember standing in there with Kim and her family beside us. And I remember holding that pew in front of me and gripping it so tightly my knuckles were turning white. I didn't know what to do. I hadn't been in church in for 100 years since I was probably six or seven years old and just maybe a few times in between with my aunt and my grandmother. So I didn't really know what to expect or what to do and I didn't know what Brother Lay was going to ask me to do. But Brother Lay, as I was holding that pew in front of me, gripping it tightly with my hands, and I felt like, I felt like I could crush that pew. As I was holding it tightly, my knuckles were turning white. Brother Lay says, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. It's just my, he may as well just said, Terry, since you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, why don't you come to the front and without hesitation just like that I let go of that pew I didn't know what I was doing or I wouldn't have done it I'm a shy bashful guy I let go of that pew and I made my way to the front of that church and asked Jesus Christ to come and live in my heart not long after that I was baptized in water And I thought, Lord, why have you done this to me? Because I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm not good. But Lord, that day in November 1974, you sought me out. I don't know if anybody else came to the front that day or not. I have no clue. But I know Terry Bradley walked to the front. Full of sin. Unworthiness. And I gave my heart to Jesus Christ because he sought me out. I didn't know, I, I could not have come to him because I didn't know what I was coming to. But he came to me. And he comes to you today. He comes to you today. Good. Liz, could you and Bronk and Laura come to the, join me on the platform, please? And Miss Fernie, if you'll come join me on the piano as well this morning. The Bible is, is a collection. It's a collection of, of God through his son Jesus Christ seeking out men and women, boys and girls, just like you and I, just like you and I, he's seeking us out. Would you stand to your feet this morning? And just like he sought me out, It lands 45 years ago or so, 46, 47 years ago. He sought me out, and just like he sought me out, he's right here in this place this morning seeking you out. I want you to do something. I want you to think about this. I was in my office this morning praying before church. I thought, Lord, I preach to the same people all the time. Very seldom are there new faces in this crowd. I know most of you pretty well. I know most of you pretty well. And I know most of you have a good relationship with the Lord. Sister Kim kicked me last week, in the, or two weeks ago, in the seat because I didn't give an invitation and I'm going to give an invitation today and next Sunday 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 until I don't preach behind this desk again because you see I never know where you're at I never know what you faced 
I know you can backslide. Been there, done that. Wrote a chapter in the book. So I know you, I know there are, there's a chance that you may be cold in your spirit this morning. So today, I'm going to give an invitation. If you respond or not, I don't know. But I'm going to give you the opportunity. That's all I can do. That's all I can do. I can't drag you down here. I can't coax you down here. I can't, I can't coerce you to come down here. All I can do is give you the opportunity to come. And I'm telling you this morning that Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is relentlessly searching you out this morning. What I'm saying is, God didn't wait for you to come to Him. He didn't wait for you to come to Him. He came to you, and He's come to you right now. Right now. Right now. I'm not going to ask you to bow your, your head, close your eyes. It's hard to walk with your eyes closed and your head bowed. I'm going to ask you right now, with your, heads, your head up, your eyes wide open, God is speaking to your heart this morning. He's speaking to you this morning, and He is initiating that relationship. So let me ask you, how, just one question, how is your relationship with God this morning? How is your relationship with God this morning? Is it what it needs to be? Is it what it needs to be? Is it what it should be? Is it what it used to be? As this group sings that song, I Surrender All, they're going to ask you to come. I'm going to ask you to come. And if you need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ or renew that relationship, today is that day. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Don't worry about what others are going to say or do. They probably only wish they would do what you're doing. So as they sing, would you come? These altars are open this morning.